Thank you for being here tonight. I welcome all of you to the 2022 ACLU of Oregon membership webinar. I am Jessica Lynn Battle, a staff attorney with the ACLU of Oregon. My pronouns are she, her. The title of tonight's presentation is Anti-Democratic SCOTUS, Rallying for the Road Ahead Through People Power. Tonight, we'll have the opportunity to hear from the ACLU of Oregon's Executive Director, Sandy Chung, our colleagues at the ACLU of Idaho and ACLU of Kansas, Adika Singh and Micah Cubic, and my ACLU of Oregon teammates, Mariana Garcia Medina and Yvonne Garcia. To get us started, I would like to share some groundings for our webinar. This event is recorded and will be available on our website tomorrow. Please feel free to share the recording link with friends and family. We will also follow up with links and actions via email. Before we get started, I'd like to thank our captioner, Jamie Pellegrino from LNS Captioning, and our ASL interpreters, Kaylee Collins and Carrie Moore. Today, many of us are located on the traditional village sites of the Multnomah, Kithlamet, Clackamas, Chinook, Tualatin, Kalapuya, Malala, and other indigenous nations. We pay our respects to our elders, past and present, who have stewarded this plan for generations. I'd also like to ground us today in group agreements. By participating today, it is our expectation that you will create a space which values and respects differences of race, ethnicity, immigration status, age, gender, sexual orientation, gender identity, religion, ability, and socioeconomic circumstance. We each will respect and contribute to the ACU of Oregon's culture of belonging by fostering an equitable and inclusive experience in all aspects of community work by, by centering the voices and experiences of historically disenfranchised and oppressed communities, including Black, Indigenous, and people of color communities. This will look like listening to understand, making space for and prioritizing oppressed voices, speaking your truth responsibly, taking responsibility for your impact regardless of your intent, and for white people and other privileged identities to not put the burden on BIPOC and other oppressed groups to educate you about the harm that your actions and behavior created, and being willing to do things differently and experience discomfort seeing discomfort and tension as an opportunity to grow, not a barrier to it. Thank you for being here with us tonight and honoring this space. Now I'd like to introduce our first speaker, Sandy Chung, Executive Director of the ASA of Oregon. Good evening, everyone. My name is Sandy Chung. My pronouns are she and her. I'm the Executive Director of the ASA of Oregon. Thank you so much for being here with us tonight. In June of this year, the US Supreme Court issued a series of decisions that were extremely harmful on our civil liberties, civil rights, and democracy. Almost all of these decisions were made by six justices, Chief Justice John Roberts and Justices Clarence Thomas, Samuel Vito, Neil Gorsuch, Brett Kavanaugh, and Amy Coney Barrett. During this presentation, I will refer to these justices as the anti-democracy justices. People across our country are deeply worried and scared by the multiple decisions of the Supreme Court that take away fundamental rights from people and communities. I will start tonight's presentation with an overview of six deeply concerning decisions from June and speak about why these decisions are an attack on our democracy. After my presentation, our colleagues from the Idaho from Idaho and Kansas will share with you the impact of the Supreme Court decisions on their states, as well as ways their communities are fighting for their civil liberties and civil rights. Then we will turn to my colleagues at the ACLU of Oregon, who will share with you an overview of the important work done by Oregonians that has lessened some of the harms of these Supreme Court decisions in our state. They will also share with you the work that remains to be done and how you can join us in this work so that we can ensure Oregon is a beacon for civil liberties, civil rights, and democracy across our nation. The decision that has been most publicized from June is Dobbs v. Jackson Women's Health Organization. In this case, the court's six anti-democracy justices took away the rights of women, girls, and all people who can become pregnant to control their bodies and lives. Never before has the Supreme Court taken away a fundamental constitutional right from so many people across, across our country, ignoring 
almost 50 years of its own decisions that affirm people's right to bodily autonomy and abortion. Specifically, the Dobbs Court held that the US Constitution does not protect the right to abortion because, and this is according to the anti-democracy justices, the abortion right is not deeply rooted in this nation's history and traditions. However, this is simply not true. This statement is manipulative and a selective interpretation of US history that ignores the historic and current experiences of women and historically oppressed groups in America, especially black women. Taking away the right to abortion takes away many important aspects of bodily autonomy, including the ability of pregnant people to make health decisions that affect their bodily safety. Another decision from June that attacked the right to bodily safety was New York State Rifle and Pistol Association versus Bruin. In this case, the Supreme Court attacked the ability of states to pass reasonable gun safety regulations to address the horrific levels of gun violence and mass shootings experienced in America. In this case, the six anti-democracy justices struck down a New York State gun safety law that was more than a century old. And in doing so, they sidestepped the plain words of the Second Amendment, which starts with the phrase, a well-regulated militia. This is a case in which ACLU National filed a legal document with the Supreme Court in support of New York gun safety regulations because our fundamental civil liberties and democracy are endangered when people fear gathering in public spaces because of potential gun violence. Another June decision that attacked the right to bodily autonomy and community safety is West Virginia versus EPA. In this case, the six anti-democracy justices hindered federal efforts to address climate change by controlling carbon dioxide emissions. With this decision, the anti-democracy justices ignore the calls of communities for urgent action on climate change. Appeals being made because people in communities across the US and the world are increasingly experiencing the devastating and dangerous impacts of climate change. The right to bodily safety was also attacked in two police accountability cases before the Supreme Court, Vega v. Tico and Egbert, Egbert versus Boulay. In these decisions, the six anti-democracy justices held that people harmed by the unconstitutional misconduct or violence of local and federal law enforcement cannot pursue accountability by seeking monetary damages through civil lawsuits and courts. The court's majority took the position that it would not be proper to create court doctrine to keep the police accountable through civil lawsuits. These decisions mean that people cannot seek accountability through the courts, through civil lawsuits, when police cause harm, even very significant harm, and that the courts are increasingly limited in being able to address and prevent harms by the police. Another extremely dangerous and harmful decision from June by the anti-democracy justices was Oklahoma versus Castro Huerta. In this decision, five of the court's anti-democracy justices with Justice Neil Gorsuch dissenting, rolled back the long established sovereignty rights of tribal governments in the US. In doing this, these justices ignored a long history of precedential law. Here law, that recognized the inherent power of tribal governments on their own lands. The high court departed from centuries of federal Indian law by giving state prosecutors authority to infringe tribal sovereignty. What are common themes that we saw in these June decisions? First, these decisions rolled back an array of rights at an unprecedented level. Over the sweep of history, we have seen the US Supreme Court generally move in the direction of expanding rights and freedoms for all, including historically disenfranchised and marginalized communities. However, the decisions this June were unprecedented in how much they rolled back constitutional rights for tens, if not hundreds of millions of people across our nation. A second theme, in many of the June decisions, we saw the anti-democracy justices obstruct and attack the right of people and communities to keep themselves autonomous and safe. Autonomous and safe from dangers, ranging from the serious health consequences of an unplanned pregnancy to the dangers of gun violence and climate change to the violence of unchecked police misconduct. A third theme, 
in many of the June decisions. The Supreme Court's majority ignore their own prior decisions and standards. Instead, they simply made up new so-called standards or reasons for deviating from prior decisions, no matter how weak or shaky the new standards or reasons. And fourth, the June decisions negatively affect most people across the US and they have disproportionately harmful impacts on historically disenfranchised and marginalized groups. What we cannot ignore is that there is a growing chasm between the anti-democracy justices on the US Supreme Court and the people of our country. People and communities across the US have repeatedly demonstrated by words and actions that they care deeply about abortion rights, gun violence, climate change, police violence, and the rights of indigenous people. However, the June decisions demonstrate an arrogant and harmful disregard and disrespect by the anti-democracy justices for the viewpoints and experiences of many people in America. What we experience in June is an attack on the health of our nation and democracy by the highest court in our country. This is a time of deep alarm for our nation, but it is also a time for communities to come together to fight for our rights, freedoms, and democracy. So that we can learn about how the US Supreme Court's decisions have impacted people outside Oregon, I would like to introduce our next speaker, Arika Singh, the legal director of the ACLU of Idaho. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for having me. Uh, I'm Adika Singh, the legal director for the ACLU of Idaho. I use she, her pronouns. Um, and uh, I'm here to answer Sandy's questions. <laughs> Anika, thank you so much for being here with us tonight. C can you first share with us how the Supreme Court's decisions in June, Dobbs and others, have impacted people in Idaho? Absolutely. Um, well, thank you. First of all, thank you so much for having me. Um, and, and really thanks to the ACLU of Oregon for being such a good friend to the ACLU of Idaho. Um, we're really lucky to have such supportive neighbors. Um, uh, we are uh, experiencing great chaos, um, fear, and a deep chill in the medical provider community, not just, you know, abortion providers who are no longer, you know, obviously able to provide abortions in the state. So abortions are just not accessible here in Idaho. Um, but family physicians, OBGYNs are now chilled also from providing other reproductive health care, such as providing treatment for ectopic pregnancies in a clinical setting, um, uh, from uh, treating miscarriages uh, without fear of criminal or civil prosecution. So we have two recently uh, enacted statutes that our Idaho Supreme Court chose not to block the enforcement of. So presently, Doctors here in Idaho um, can be civilly liable for thousands of dollars um, if um, they provide abortion-related care for, um, for a person. And so basically the, the relative of the fetus, so for example, um, the, you know, the uncle uh, you know, of the fetus, um, let's say, or the, you know, the, the, the brother of uh, um, someone who perpetrated rape, um, on someone um, could now sue the medical provider for providing uh, abortion related care to the person who was pregnant and chose to terminate that pregnancy. Um, but we also now have criminal liability for, for folks who are providing abortion related care or really any other care that um, extracts a fetus, um, even one that's not viable or one that has already died in the body of the pregnant person from that person's body. Um, we are, you know, people are leaving, you know, people who have talent and options and money and privilege are leaving the state of Idaho. Um, you know, medical providers are leaving the state of Idaho. Um, we, we already had lots of parts of the state that did not have adequate um, healthcare coverage. And I think things were just get much, much worse for those folks. Um, and, you know, really we're just dealing with a, a sense of real fear and chaos and, and worries about the next legislative session, which will also likely bring an effort to ban access to con contraception. So I'll stop there with, that's the doom and gloom. <laughs> Things are looking real bad here in Idaho. Harika, I don't even know what to say. It's just so horrible 
it sounds like on so many levels, people and communities are being harmed and just even the system of mass incarceration now being used to enforce people from being able to access abortions. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, so, you know, our statutes um, identify providers as the targets um, because really we, we want, our legislature has wanted to just basically block access to reproductive health care. Um, but we know from what we've seen in other states that it's not just going to be medical providers who are prosecuted. Um, you know, we have uh, someone who is likely to win the next attorney general's race who has already committed to setting up an abortion prosecution team. Um, and they're gonna be going after not just providers, but pregnant people and supporters of pregnant people. So folks who, you know, give money to get out of state to drive someone across the border to Oregon. Um, uh, I'm getting questions from clergy, you know, faith leaders, Unitarians, Jewish people saying, you know, can I, can I counsel um, someone, uh, you know, who has, uh, who is considering, you know, leaving the state to get the care that they need. Um, so, you know, this, and, and it's, frankly, it's beyond just pregnancy. We have seen attacks on gender and race, you know, people of different races as well, but um, our LGBTQ community is also very under threat here with, you um, uh, you know, transgender sports ban. Uh, we saw an effort to pass uh, a, a ban on gender affirming care. We succeeded this legislative session. The, the ACLU and our partners succeeded in the legislative session blocking that, that effort uh, in the legislature, but we think it's going to come back next year. We've had an election and we don't think we'll have the votes to stop that gender affirming care ban from passing and becoming law. Adika, what you're describing in Idaho, I think for many of us, is even worse than what we could have imagined. Here at the ACLU of Oregon, one thing our staff have been talking about is that when times are dark, we can create our own light. I wanna ask you, how is the ACLU of Idaho and its community fighting back against these efforts to take away fundamental rights and freedoms? And you had mentioned the successful effort in the prior legislative session to fight back the attacks on um, gender affirming healthcare. But are there other things that the ACLU of Idaho and its community is doing? Yes. So yeah, we're not taking this lying down. Um, and you know, one of the most the, the light is really coming from you know, so many advocates that are now, you know, we're together, we're all together in this fight. We have these Friday morning calls of, you know, faith leaders, friendly legislators, family physicians, OBGYNs, you know, employment lawyers um, coming together, sharing information, supporting each other, you know, uh, working to file declarations in the federal, the federal MTALA lawsuit, which I might talk about a little bit later, um, you know, to work on getting amicus briefs into the Idaho Supreme Court, which will finally decide this question of whether or not our statutes are um, uh, constitutional under the Idaho Constitution. So that's the first thing that we're doing. We chose to, the ACLU of Idaho chose to work behind the scenes with our partners at Planned Parenthood and Wilmer Hale to um, litigate basically the Hail Mary set of lawsuits to block enforcement of the most recently passed criminal and civil bans on abortion. Um, we have uh, next Thursday is the, is the um, oral argument in those cases. Um, and that's sort of an effort, you know, on, under a couple of different um, state constitutional theories to just take the statutes down, block, you know, full enforcement. Um, I, I feel like it's a 50-50 chance that we'll be able to do that. And so, you know, um, you know, while we're providing support, you know, mooting, mooting that team, you know, doing kind of mock oral argument, um, editing briefs, we filed an amicus brief um, in that case. Um, because in Idaho, you, uh, there aren't a lot of civil rights attorneys working in Idaho. Um, and and, there, and Planned Parenthood doesn't have anyone on the ground. And so we've sort of been their, you know, local strategist, um, an advisor on that litigation, the Idaho Supreme Court. But that aside, which may or may not win, that set of, you know, there are three lawsuits in the Idaho Supreme Court. We're also um, starting to develop additional affirmative litigation uh, to start to chip away at these statutes. So we're assuming that we will lose in the Idaho Supreme Court, what are other ways that we can highlight the more extreme applications of these statutes to start to, uh, you know, claw back our rights over a period of, of years. 
So that's the one, you know, the one sort of affirmative thing that we're doing, a couple of reactive things that we're doing. Um, we're doing a lot of one-on-one -on -one and group counseling with, um, with providers, with medical providers. They have a lot of questions about what can I say? What can I do? Um, I have a license in Oregon and in Idaho. So I probably get two or three calls a day or emails a day from providers throughout the state. We're very, very concerned about what is permissible behavior and what is going to land them in jail um, for five years or more. Um, the th uh, third thing we're doing, really kind of dark, but necessary, is we're working with private and public criminal defense attorneys, and uh, folks have been doing this work in other places, um, which is getting ready for prosecutions, criminal prosecutions, um, and, you know, working on sample briefs and motions and arguments to, to to protect people who are prosecuted for terminating their pregnancy or supporting someone who's terminated their pregnancy. Um, and I think those are the, the major things. Doctors here too are also organizing, kind of getting on the same page, establishing standards of care um, to get to a point where, you know, some more basic reproductive health care is still accessible. Um, and, and they're doing a lot of really excellent work um, in advance of the next legislative session. Anika, just what you're describing, you're doing such important work, but also such hard work. Can you tell us how people in Oregon can support you and your colleagues at the ACLU of Idaho and just people in Idaho? Absolutely, yes. Well, keep abortion legal. <laughs> That's one thing. Um, and keep, you know, reproductive health care legal. I mean, you know, have, you know, it is really hard. I mean, a lot of us here, I'm directly impacted. You know, I um uh, expect this, I'm um, you know, pregnant now and expect my pregnancy to be very complicated and perhaps to suffer a miscarriage. And I, I'm concerned that I'm not going to be able to get the care that I need here in Idaho because no one will provide it for me. So I, like many people will be, who have money and access and, you know, access to abortion funds, um, will be moving, not move, maybe moving someday, but, you know, certainly traveling to a place like Oregon to get the care. So keeping your clinics open. I know that there, the clinic in Ontario, Oregon has been struggling um, to get public support for the work um, that they are trying to do for Idahoans and Oregonians. So providing support, emotional, you know, logistical, financial support to, to, to providers um, and clinics in, in, in Oregon is really important. Supporting the ACLU of Oregon, I don't think there's a more important time to be in the fight with civil rights attorneys in this country uh, than now. So, you know, continuing to support um, the ACLU of Oregon. Um, and gosh, um, what else? I think, um, so, you know, support these abortion travel funds, um, provide that emotional and logistical support to Idahoans who are coming across the border to get care. Um, and, and, and yeah, I think, and invite us to share our stories. Um, Thank you. Haika, thank you so much. I think one thing that what you're describing in terms of the experience of people in Idaho is um, hitting with me is at times it seems like the work of ACLU is really broad. Everything from criminal legal rights and that system and mass incarceration and trying to dismantle that system to reproductive justice and the right to abortion and re reproductive health care. But then here we're seeing just so many of those different issue areas coming together and how we have a really unique experience and place with all of these issue areas coming together in this fight. Aika, thank you so much for sharing with us the experience of the people in Idaho and how communities there are fighting back and looking out for each other. Um, I hope that we can continue to be in just deep partnership and support going forward. But thank you so much for the work that you're doing in Idaho. Thank you, thanks for having me. Next, I'd like to invite our guest, Dr. Micah Kubik, Executive Director of the ACLU of Kansas, who'll be sharing with us the experiences of people in Kansas. Yeah, good evening, Micah. everyone. Good evening, everybody. My name is Mike. Uh, I'm coming to you tonight from the very uh, stinky environment of the parking lot of the Hutchison Public Library in Hutchison, Kansas, or west of Wichita. 
Uh, I'm glad to be here. I uh, am especially glad to be here. Uh, uh, you know, I tell you, you just say yes and don't let her finish the sentence. Mike, uh, can you first tell us how the Supreme Court's decisions in June impacted people in Kansas and how the people in Kansas responded? Sure. So, you know, uh, like a lot of people around this country, uh, we were devastated and angry about the Dobbs decision, not terribly surprised. Uh, those uh, who have been active in the reproductive Kansas and around the country uh, have watched for the last few decades uh, as they came after uh, various procedures after lots of restrictions, actually hearing. So, uh, we knew what was coming. We didn't know the, the date or the hour or the time, the place, uh, but we knew that it was coming. And so we have prepared a little bit ahead of time, uh, working with our partners at Planned Parenthood and, and elsewhere. Uh, we had worked to have the Kansas Supreme Court back in 2019 uh, that the state constitution included uh, a right to access reproductive uh, a right to abortion. We did that both because it's the right thing to do, uh, but also because we knew that the federal uh, system was not in our And so when the Supreme Court ruled as it did, uh, the state court right came in. Uh, and in Kansas, uh, there have, were some folks who were really upset and worked for the last couple of years, an amendment on the ballot would overturn what the state Supreme Court therefore get rid of the state would essentially pave the way for a total ban on abortion every single instance. Uh, and so when the stakes were very clear like that, it was clear that the Supreme Court ruled uh, that we had an opportunity on August 2nd uh, in our primary election on August 2nd, to be the very first state in the country to talk back to the politicians, to talk back uh, to the extremists, to talk back uh, to Sam Alito and his band of judicial hooligans and say that this is not something that we were willing to stand for. Uh, and so the people of Kansas turned out uh, overwhelmingly uh, to say that they believed in a right to access abortion, believed that women and people who are able to make their own health, believed uh, that the government should stay out of these individual personal private decisions, uh, and they believed that they should overwhelmingly, despite the odds against them. Uh, and I think it's a great example of the fact that, uh, of the true fact, right, that they are loud, uh, they are visible, uh, they are everywhere. They try to intimidate folks, uh, but they command a distinct minority, uh, even in a state like Kansas, which has a uh, reputation for being conservative. No one, no one thinks of Kansas as a civil liberal paradise on the plane. Uh, but despite that, uh, we were able to turn back this extremist. Micah, um, could you get a little bit closer to your mic? Um, it was cutting out a little bit at times. But, you know, so thank you so much for sharing that wonderful work in Kansas. But basically, there were a group of extremists who tried to put a ballot measure on that would have removed state constitutional protections for abortion. But my understanding is almost 60% of Kansan voters rejected that referendum. Absolutely right. So 58% of Kansans uh, voted on August 2nd to protect that right, uh, did so overwhelmingly in counties all over the state, not just the urban areas, but even in uh, rural parts of the state, and no to extremism. Micah, was this win something that you and partners and allies in the work had anticipated? Uh, so I, I will be honest and say that there were many folks who did not believe that this was possible. Uh, there were a lot of folks who thought that Kansas had a reputation for being conservative. Uh, some folks may remember many years ago, uh, Wichita, Kansas was the home of the so-called Summer of Mercy, 
uh, where anti-abortion extremists from all over the country converged on Wichita and made it the capital of the anti-choice movement. And of course, doctors in Kansas have literally been murdered uh, for providing reproductive care. Uh, a lot of folks thought this wasn't possible. I thought it was, though, and the team at the ACLU thought it was, uh, and our partners at Planned Parenthood and Trust Women thought it was, uh, and that was because we talked to real Kansans, uh, and we knew that although the extremists talked a lot, there was never a single day in Kansas history uh, where a majority of Kansans wanted abortion to be banned. There was never a single day where the extremists actually had their pulse on the people of the state. They may vote one way, they may believe a lot of things, but one thing they don't want is the government making these decisions. Uh, they want to take care of one another. Uh, they want freedom to prevail. And so I absolutely believe that, that it was going to happen. I didn't think it would happen with 58%. I thought it was more a 51-49 sort of proposition. Uh, so we were immensely gratified when the turnout was the highest turnout in primary election history. Uh, more people turned out in the primary than normally turn out in a general election in Kansas. Uh, and that was because they wanted an opportunity to vote no on this thing day. Mike, I, I remember that night when the results were coming in, and this was during the summer, so close in time to the DOP decision in June, when I think all of us were feeling pretty down and very worried. And I remember just how incredibly energized and hopeful I felt after seeing the work in Kansas. I wanted to ask, in addition to work in the right in the area of abortion rights, what other battles are you and folks fighting in Kansas related to our civil liberties and civil rights? Thank you for asking. And, and I'm glad that it is inspiring uh, to you. And it's inspiring to folks here in Kansas that this happened. Uh, you know, I, I, like, I love the poet Pablo Neruda, and I love this line of his where he says, you can cut down all the flowers, but you cannot stop spring from coming. Uh, and that's what this moment was really about to me and to us was a, a, a truth. Uh, that said, uh, the other battles that we are fighting are in some measure directly tied to this. The biggest one is around voting rights. As the extremists who brought us this amendment, at uh, your point before, Sandy, uh, they're not big fans of democracy in general, uh, especially when it gives them outcomes that they don't like. Uh, and so already they are scheming and plotting uh, ways to make it harder for folks to participate in the elections in November and moving forward. Uh, and that's because the lesson that they took from the tail kicking that they got in August was not perhaps we should stop doing unpopular things, perhaps we should stop taking away people's rights. No, that, that's not the lesson they took. Uh, they did not engage in a period of deep self-reflection after the uh, Instead, what they said is, uh, how can we make it harder for the people to express their views? How can we make it harder for people to stop us from implementing our agenda? Uh, and so already they're working hard to intimidate voters, uh, to restrict access to early voting and advanced voting. Uh, and so we're pushing back hard uh, against that. I, I believe that we will succeed because we have done so in the past. We have stopped the voter restrictions here. Uh, you know, Kansas is home to Chris Kobach, who is a uh, nationally uh, reviled uh, leader in the voter suppression movement. Uh, and he is campaigning with others to make it harder for folks to vote here. So we're pushing back against that. I think we're going to succeed. Uh, and, and all of this is linked together uh, to democracy. It's all about uh, whether folks are included in the community or excluded from it. Uh, and so that's the battle we're fighting here, to make sure that we say that uh, everyone matters, that everyone is part of this community, everyone is included in it. There are no internal exiles here. Micah, that is so inspiring. And I think definitely we, the people in Oregon, want to fight, join in this fight for democracy. What advice do you think Kansans have for folks in states like Oregon? You know, so as I talk to folks uh, here and around the country, so many people uh, say that the world feels like it's on fire, that it just seems overwhelming. Uh, a lot of folks get caught up in the challenges of it all. And I would just say, uh, not get caught up in that. Remember what is possible. Remember that this is a movement that can prevail. Uh, and uh, I said 
before I like poetry, right? So Pablo Neruda, Neruda's one I like. My very favorite is always Langston Hughes. He's from Kansas. Harlan claims him, but we claim him first. Uh, and Langston Hughes wrote a great poem in the 1940s that said, uh, democracy will not come, okay, this year, not ever, through compromise and fear. Democracy will not come today, this year, not ever, through compromise. And I think the reason that we succeed as a movement, the reason we succeeded on August 2nd, and the reason we will succeed in the future is because we are fearless. And I think there is no group of people uh, anywhere in this world who is more fearless than ACLU folks, whether they be in Kansas or whether they be in Idaho, whether they be in Oregon. Uh, I think we are a fearless bunch of people. Uh, and so that would be the advice that I would give to you as, as democracy is under attack. Uh, let's remember what old Langston Hughes said. Uh, and be uncompromising and fearless. Micah, thank you so much. And I think what you're telling us, again, brings me back to what our team has been saying. In darkness, we make our own light. Micah, thank you so much for sharing with us the experience of people in Kansas, for just the magnificent work that Kansas have done and that you've really been a leader in. This is just benefiting not just folks in Kansas, but Oregonians too, and people across the US. Thank you so much now, for having me, I appreciate it. Thank you so much, Micah. Now I would like to invite my teammate, Mariana Garcia Medina, to share with us how Oregonians have made our state a leader in the fight for civil liberty, civil rights, and democracy. Thank you, Sandy. Hi, everyone. My name is Mariana Garcia Medina, she, her, ella pronouns, and I'm the Senior Policy Associate with the ACLU of Oregon. I'm excited to share with you all a little bit of that fearless history and continuing fight that we have here in Oregon. Um, and a part of that is the important democracy, civil liberties, and civil rights work that the people in Oregon have been doing for decades and continue to work on. Um, this work has helped to lessen the harmful impact of the U.S. Supreme Court June decisions on people and communities in Oregon. This is work that the policy team here at the ASOU of Oregon continues to be engaging in Salem and in local governments. In sharing this history of good and important work, I also really want to acknowledge that Oregon has a complicated history, history of white supremacy and oppression as well. Our state ha has an imperfect history and much of the work that we do um, in much of that work and our state has also engaged in important um, innovations in the area of democracy, rights, and freedoms. In my presentation, I will cover three areas that have been targeted by anti-democracy forces across the US, democratic struggles that and encourage inclusion and participation, the rights of women, girls, and people that can become pregnant um, for their bodily autonomy and abortion, and the rights of our LGBTQ plus community to equality. First, let's go ahead and start with how Oregon has been an innovator in democratic practices that encourage people to, for direct power and voter participation. We were one of the first three states in the nation in 1902 to do initiative petitions known as ballot measures. With initiative petitions, if enough people support a new idea, a new law by providing their signatures, they can get, on, get it on the ballot and have people vote for it either in favor or against. Oregon was also the first state in the country in 1998 to do universal vote by mail. Research so shows that voting by mail can increase voter participation and it is very popular with voters because it makes voting more accessible including ex making it more accessible for older people, people with disabilities, and people with work and family responsibilities. Oregon was an early adopter of voter of pre-voter registration, which legalized was legalized in our state in 2007. Pre-registration means that the youth can pre-register to vote before they are 18. Currently in Oregon, 16 and 17 year olds are able to pre-register to vote in Oregon. Oregon was the first U.S. state to adopt automatic voter registration, which was passed in 2015. This allows people to easily get registered to vote at the DMV. As many of this example shows that Oregon has been a leader in the U.S. in trying and finding new ways to encourage direct democracy and voter participation. 
Next, I want to talk to you all about how Oregon has been a leader and champion in the abortion space. Oregon has some of the strongest abortion rights protections in the U.S. In 2017, our state passed a state law protecting abortion rights through the Reproductive Health Equity Act. In Oregon, abortion services are covered under our state Medicaid coverage program, and state law requires that private health care plans also cover abortions. Oregon does not have any of the major abortion restrictions that we find in other states, but this is really due to the people and organizations in Oregon that have been successfully fighting against efforts to that that do not support abortion rights. For example, in 2018, Oregon voters rejected a ballot measure by anti-abortion groups to prohibit the use of public funds for abortions. But even though Oregon has the least restrictive laws in the nation, not everyone has the same level of access to abortion and reproductive health care, including people of color, low-income people, disabled people, and people in rural areas. To support more equitable access, in early 2022, before the Supreme Court in June, the state passed a law legislation that would grant $15 million to provide support, including travel expenses and lodging for people seeking abortion care here in the state of Oregon. Finally, but not least, I'd like to share with you all about how Oregonians have worked to protect the rights of our LGBTQ community. In 1971, Oregon decriminalized same-sex sexual relations. And in 1998, the state of Oregon provided benefits to state employees in same-sex relationships. And in 2008, made domestic partnerships available to same-sex Oregonians. In 2014, same-sex Oregonians obtained the right to marry in court. And currently same-sex couples, both married and unmarried, may apply to adopt for children. Starting with the Oregon Equality Act passed in 2007 and multiple laws that we've been passing since, Oregon has continued to pass legal protections against bullying, harassment, discrimination, and hate crimes that protect the LGBTQ plus community. Next slide, please. Our state also has passed many laws and has had several court decisions supporting the rights of our trans community here in Oregon. In our state, transgender individuals can apply to change legal gender solely by request. And DMB and birth certificate documents have a third choice of gender to designate neutral or non-binary gender identity. State legal protections against bullying, harassment, discrimination, and hate crimes also protect the trans community. After my colleague Ivan speaks, you'll have the opportunity to view a short video in which our prior deputy director, Jan Carson, shares some highlights of ACLU and of Oregon's history of work during our last 36 years in this organization and advocating for our community. In summary, Oregon has a long history of protecting democracy, civil liberties, and civil rights. However, these protections and advancement did not happen overnight. They happened because people in Oregon kept fighting for these rights year after year, decade after decade, and fearlessly, including during times when the courts and the legislature were hostile to such efforts. In this current times with a Supreme Court that is hostile to democracy, civil liberties, and civil rights, it is important to remember our history. We can use these lessons of history to motivate us in continuing to fight for our democracy, our rights, and our freedoms. Thank you for the opportunity in sharing some of Oregon's history with you all. And as our final speaker, I would like to introduce my amazing colleague and teammate, Ivan Garcia. Thank you, Mariana. Hello, good evening, everyone. My name is Yvonne Garcia. My pronouns are she and her, and I am the Deputy Director of the ACLU of Oregon. Earlier this evening, you heard from our Executive Director, Sandy Chung, who spoke about how the current anti-democracy justices on the US Supreme Court attacked rights fundamental to our democracy during their June session. 
Unfortunately, it is likely that the anti-democracy justices will continue to issue decisions harmful to our democracy, civil liberties, and civil rights. For example, the Supreme Court will be hearing a voting case next month, Moore versus Harper, that could radically change congressional and presidential elections by giving broad, largely unchecked power to state legislators over federal elections. Given the voter suppression that we are already seeing in states across the country, especially in states with significant Black, Brown, and Indigenous communities, it is deeply concerning that the current Supreme Court has agreed to hear a case that could allow state legislatures to engage in even more anti-democratic election practices with less oversight and accountability than today. The Supreme Court will be hearing another case, Hallen versus Brackeen, that could limit the rights of Native American parents and tribes. In that case, the Supreme Court will consider rolling back a federal law that prioritizes placement of Indian children with relatives. The purpose of this law is to rectify past abuses of Native American children being removed from their homes and tribes. ACLU National and multiple ACLU state affiliates submitted an amicus brief to the Supreme Court opposing rolling back this law because it would cause significant harm to Native American children, families, and communities. As well, there is the real possibility that the Supreme Court may roll back other fundamental rights in future sessions. Just as Clarence Thomas said in the Dobbs decision, that in addition to rolling back abortion as a constitutional right, the Supreme Court had a duty to correct the error of prior US Supreme Court decisions that established the rights we consider fundamental, including the right to contraception and same-sex marriage. Unfortunately, attacks against our democracy, civil liberties and civil rights are not limited to the US Supreme Court. We have seen legislatures and courts across the country restricting abortion rights and even penalizing or criminalizing it. And they have been assailing the bodily autonomy and safety of transgender people as well. Even in Oregon, there are schools, school boards banning displays of support for Black and LGBTQ plus students. And there are anti-abortion group efforts to roll back abortion rights here in our state. So while we can appreciate the support for democracy, rights, and freedoms here in Oregon, we also cannot be complacent. I'd like to share with you how your support for the ACLU of Oregon powers the fight for democracy, rights, and freedoms, not just here in our state, but across the country. ACLU national and state affiliates have established ways to share financial resources, knowledge, and support. This means that when Oregonians support the ACLU of Oregon, this support is shared with ACLU National and other state affiliates. So the support of Oregon ACLU members and supporters powers the justice work across our country. An important example of this effort is the work of the ACLU Southern Collective. This is a coordinated effort by ACLU National and a collective of ACLU state affiliates in, our, in Southern states, from Alabama to Mississippi to Florida and others, who are fighting back voter suppression by organizing people, going to court, and working in their, in their legislatures. Other important work has been occurring to support abortion rights. In just the first week following Dobbs, ACLU national and state affiliates took legal action to fight abortion bans in 11 states. Almost every ACLU state affiliate from ACLU of Oregon to the ACLU of West Virginia is involved in fighting for abortion rights at the state level. ACLU national and state affiliates across the US have also been fighting for the rights of transgender people including their fundamental right to receive health care in legislatures and courts and in government agencies. These are just some examples of the many ways the ACLU community across the US is fighting to defend the rights and freedoms at risk by the anti-democracy justices on the Supreme Court.
Here in Oregon, we've been working hard to strengthen abortion access, even more in our state. And we have taken legal action to defend Black and LGBTQ plus students against racist, homophobic, and transphobic school boards. And during the upcoming 2023 legislative session, we will be working on multiple pieces of legislation to strengthen democracy, abortion rights, and transgender rights for all people in Oregon. We're also supporting ballot measures, including state and local measures that increase democracy and civil liberties and civil rights. These measures include making healthcare a constitutional right in our Oregon constitution. It includes removing slavery as punishment for crime that currently sits in our Oregon constitution. Keeping Oregon state elected officials accountable for missing too many legislative sessions and also supporting more inclusive and effective democratic practices at the city of Portland and in Multnomah County. These are only some of the many types of work the ACLU of Oregon is doing to strengthen democracy and our rights and freedoms. Now I'm sure you are asking, what are the ways you can stay engaged, support our work and receive updates? And here are some things you can do. Vote, November 8 is election day. You can read more about our ballot measure endorsements and even sign up to volunteer for campaigns on our website. Tune in. In January, we will be hosting our 2023 Legislative Session Preview Webinar, and we invite you to come and learn about our legislative priorities for the upcoming session. We will also be hosting our 2023 Lobby Days event, which this year will have both virtual and in-person participation options. We're also inviting you to read more. We are so excited for you all to check out our upcoming magazine that will become available in early October. We're also asking you to share feedback. Let us know what you think of this event, what questions you still have, and what engagement opportunities you would like to see. And of course, donate or become a member. You can support our work by making a tax deductible gift to the ACLU Foundation of Oregon, or by becoming or renewing your membership to the ACLU of Oregon. As civil rights leader, Fannie Lou Hamer so powerfully stated, nobody's free until everybody's free. Together, we can use our people power as community members, organizers, educators, and voters to protect democracy, civil liberties, and civil rights for all across our state and country. Thank you for being part of our 2022 annual meeting. Now, before asking my teammate, Rachel Dalal Gale, to provide closing remarks, I invite you to watch this video, which highlights some of our historical work and our path forward. Fights are never done. With regards to justice work and the fight to protect and advance the rights of all of our communities, we can't ever become complacent. A lot of this work, we make some progress in an area and then we get a backlash. The realization that fighting for civil liberties and civil rights is generational, it can be a little daunting. The ACLU has, throughout its history, been involved in advancing free speech, mass incarceration, the war on drugs, immigration, race equity issues, protecting the rights to protest. We work on so many different issues. These things are all connected. We may not be able to solve everything by ourselves or in our lifetimes. However, each of us has a responsibility to engage in the work of justice and to do our part. And I think if you look at it in that way, that we are part of a bigger community and part of a bigger history, doing the work of justice, not only is it something that is doable, but it's something that's unavoidable. I was hired at the ACLU of Oregon back in 1986 
It was like a fire hose every day of new information and new opportunities. Being in a state that allows the citizenry to initiate their own laws, we fought a lot of battles around gay and lesbian rights. Over the course of 20 some years, Oregon faced more than 30 anti-gay ballot measures at the state and local level, more than in any other state in the country. And the ACLU was involved in working against every single one of those. The generational fight that we're all a part of is necessary. In 86 and 87, the ACLU tried to advance a civil rights bill in the legislature. We weren't successful. In late 1987, Neil Goldschmidt signed an executive order that prohibited discrimination on the basis of sexual orientation. The Oregon Citizens Alliance used this opportunity of the executive order to put an initiative on the ballot that would repeal that executive order and then also bake discrimination based on sexual orientation into state law. A lot of people just thought, oh, that's not gonna pass, but it did. And ACLU immediately launched a lawsuit to challenge it and this one took years. Then in 1992, the Oregon Citizens Alliance qualified to the ballot, what became known as Measure 9, and this is where they really overtly are trying to dehumanize uh, gay and lesbian people by equating homosexuality with uh, bestiality and pedophilia. For the ACLU, a big part of the effort in that campaign was to try to counter some of the myths when there was an effort to dehumanize people, to, to then try to help people see that they do know people, that they probably have gay people in their families, um, in, certainly in their communities. And we were able to defeat that. ACLU has been involved in abortion litigation forever. We see reproductive justice being fundamentally about the right to, of each person to having bodily autonomy which means just control over their own bodies and lives. We also see reproductive justice work as fundamentally being racial justice work as well, because in this country, the people who've had the least control over their bodies and lives have been women of color, but especially black women because of the history of slavery in the U.S. We also became active on the No on 105, which was the ballot measure to remove what had been at that time 31 years of being a sanctuary state. That ballot measure would have allowed police to engage in racial profiling practices. Everybody came out in the end to say, no, that we value all Oregonians. Everybody should feel safe um, with um, having law enforcement only focusing on actions that have been had, not on perceived possibilities based on the color of a person's skin. Proud to say we preserved the sanctuary state that we have and that we also prevented stepping backwards in abortion rights in this state. There's a lot of intersectional work that happens and I think ACLU was at its best when we help people see how to connect the dots. We have to have the people behind us and we are just an access point. We want to be guided in doing the work that really will have a broad impact. And so we can only do that if we're hearing from the community and bringing them along in all the ways that we're able. We have to do this better. We have to do this in a more inclusive way. And that's what the ACLU tries to do. It's willing to use the processes that we have to make our democracy better. This is a time for Oregonians to really come together and fight for all of our rights. For real change to happen, we have to educate and empower people and communities to make the change themselves. We can definitely help and support with tools like the legal system, the political system, and so on, but empowerment really depends on communities coming together to defend and advance their rights. I would hope that the staff members at the ACLU of Oregon that might follow me will celebrate, celebrate that they're in this fight together. Today, love wins. And I trust 
the generations coming to do even more. Hi everyone, um, I'm Rachel DeLaw Gale, staff attorney at the ACLU of Oregon. My pronouns are she, her. I would like to thank everyone who participated tonight, especially Adika Singh, legal director of the ACLU of Idaho, and Micah Kubik, executive director of the ACLU of Kansas. I would also like to thank all of my teammates who participated tonight, as well as others who worked behind the camera to support tonight's event. Also, thank you to our captioner, Jamie Pellegrino from LNS Captioning, and our ASL interpreters, Kaylee Collins and Carrie Moore. And finally, but not least, I thank all of you, our ACLU of Oregon members and community for joining us tonight and continuing to support the work of justice in Oregon and across our country. The recording of tonight's event will be available tomorrow on our website, we encourage you to share this recording with your loved ones and your communities. Also via our website and emails to members, we will share ways that all of you can be involved in the fight for our democracy, our rights and our freedoms. Please join with us to create an Oregon and a US of greater justice, equity and care. Good night and thank you again.